Gary thought for a while about how he would deal with his wife, her friends, and their harsh and stupid reaction to what they considered cheating. He decided that even if he had cheated, what Mare had done would have ruined the marriage. The fact that they were wrong about him made that end inevitable. Gary would not tolerate being treated like garbage. He got in his car and drove to the emergency room. It was a Saturday morning, and it wasn't crowded. The woman behind the counter asked what he was complaining about. Gary said, My wife has locked my genitals in a metal cage. She doesn't have a key. I want that thing cut off. The cage. Not my genitals. The woman stared at him. She didn't smile. Go through that door. Room six on the right. A doctor will see you. One more thing, miss. I want to file a sex crime report with the police, Gary said. I'll call them. They usually have someone nearby. Gary went to room six and waited. After about five minutes, a young woman of Asian appearance entered the room. I'm Dr. G. I heard you're in trouble. You need to show her to me. Gary dropped his pants and underwear, showing Dr. G the cage. He was a little uncomfortable, but he was so angry about the whole thing that he didn't care about embarrassment. Dr. G said, I don't have anything that can cut this. It's metal. Well, get someone from maintenance. They should have something. Good idea. I'll be right back. She left. Before she returned, two police detectives peeked into the room. Both were women. One was in her early 40s with blonde hair, slim, wearing a suit and heels. The other was a redhead in slacks, early 30s, well-built. Gary pulled up his pants. You're welcome to come in. I think you've already seen everything. The blonde introduced herself as Detective Dorothy Mason. The redhead was investigator Jane Pearson. Detective Mason asked, what's wrong? Why did you call us? Gary explained, my wife mistakenly believed I was cheating on her. Two of her friends and their husbands were at my house for a social event. They drugged me, took me upstairs and put this thing on me. Mayor, my wife, mailed the keys to Oklahoma. Then she went to a hotel and had revenge sex with her co-worker. Do you have proof that they drugged you? Gary listened to the tape of his conversation with Jane and Anne. He showed them pictures and messages from his phone of Mike pleasuring Mare. The officers got his authorization for a blood test to determine if drugs had been taken. They called their sergeant. The test ended up testing positive for drugs. I need the names and addresses of your wife, her girlfriends, and their husbands. We're going to get a warrant for their arrest. That process could take hours, Pearson told Gary. Great, I know every couple has children. I would hope that provisions can be made if both parents are arrested. We'll take care of it, thanks for letting us know. At that moment, Dr. G returned with a guy dressed in overalls. He had a whole set of instruments. You'll have to sign an authorization if Tom is going to operate. She smiled and handed him the paper. He signed it. Tom tried the tin forceps. It didn't work. Then he used bolt cutters to break the lock on the device. Gary was free. Dr. G examined his dignity. I just need to see if there's any damage. She was an attractive young woman, and Gary's arousal began. Well, I can see that you have retained function to some extent. She smiled at him. Gary was embarrassed, and his face turned red. She said, you don't need to be embarrassed, Mr. Summers. May I call you Gary? Of course, and you are. Betty G, at your service. It's not every day I get to do a cajectomy. You can clean that up, Gary. Oh, yeah, sorry. He stuffed himself back into his pants. She watched him. Can I go now? Yes, just sign at the front desk. If you stay with your wife, maybe I'll see you again. She laughed when she said that. I don't know what to say to that. Maybe I'd like to see you, but not in a cage. We'll see. She walked away. Gary checked in at the front desk. Two policewomen waited outside with sodas. Mason said, The warrants will be served after dinner, maybe seven. We've decided that only three women are involved for now. The two husbands can be charged later. Good. But they carried me upstairs, and I'm sure they knew about the drug. Yes, but maybe they didn't. We need to investigate further. Three women have been charged. Multiple felonies, including sexual assault, administering illegal drugs against consent, and maybe more. Will they stay in jail? 
Most likely until Monday morning. They can't be released on felony bail. But then they'll probably be released pending trial. Can you call me when they're all arrested? The husbands can be very angry and I want to know. Pearson agreed. Then she said, I know you're very angry right now. And I know that this guy, Mike, may well be the object of your anger. But I really hope you'll contain it. For a while. I understand what you're saying, okay? Gary went to his mom's house and explained what had happened. He didn't mention the arrests. He spent some time fixing a leak in the roof of the outhouse. His dad didn't like heights. Gary never turned on his cell phone. Mary called his mom's cell phone and asked her to get him. As instructed, she told Mara I wasn't home. She played it off like she knew nothing about any of this. Around 8 o'clock, Pearson called and said that all three women had been arrested and charged with felony sexual assault and administering drugs without consent. Gary said goodbye to his parents but told them about the arrests. His dad smiled, but his mom was shocked. Why? It was a mistake. Just think about it, Mom. I have those pictures and the videotape. They committed crimes. I want them to go to jail for it. She wasn't very pleased, but she didn't say anything else. Gary drove home. He drove by the house to see how things were. It looked locked and dark. There were no suspicious cars. He pulled into the garage. He searched the house. Nothing out of the ordinary. He showered, turned on the 10 o'clock news. Nothing about arrests. He ate the rest of his spaghetti. He found an issue of the local newspaper, the Metro section. He called and left a message for the guy who usually wrote crime stories. He looked at the landline. There were four messages there. Two were from Jim and two were from Tim. He listened to all four. One each from Jim and Tim were pretty nasty, even threatening. Jim said, you'll get what's coming to you. Don't worry. Tim, a little later, called him a jerk and said, payback is a bitch. Gary found that somewhat ironic, given the situation. He called Mason and played the calls for her. She thanked him, told him not to erase them, and to come back in the morning. Gary went online and did his best to separate his finances from Mary's. He withdrew all the money he could from his checking account and a large amount from his savings account. He removed Mari's name from his 401k. He did a few other things that could be done online. Gary thought about Mike O'Sullivan for a long time. He called his buddy. He wanted to follow O'Sullivan for a while. Then he went to bed. The phone was still off. The home landline rang around 10 o'clock Sunday morning. Gary switched the receiver to voicemail. It was Mare. Gary, I'm so sorry. This is the only call I've gotten. I assume you know I've been arrested. Anne and Jane do too. We know you did this to us. We can talk about it later. I hope you'll come to the bail hearing on Monday and get me out of jail. Please, this was a mistake. Please. Beep. Gary listened to all the messages on his cell phone for Saturday. Almost all of them were from Mare. She wanted to know when he was coming home to make amends. She was so sorry. She had been crying. She begged him to come and talk to her. She loved him so much. Blah, blah, blah. And so on and on. Then in rage, then in anger. The last message, telling him he had to forgive her if he wanted to get out of the cage, was interrupted by a knock on the door. Mare carried her cell phone with her. A man's voice. Are you Mari Summers? Yes, what is it? It's Gary. I hope nothing happened to him. I'll never be able to forgive myself, she mumbled. You're under arrest for sexual assault. You have the right. There was a scream, or rather a yell. The phone fell to the floor. That son of a bitch bastard, I'll never forgive him for this. Stop it. Stop it. Calm down, ma'am. We need to cuff you. Please show us where your identification is. My purse over there on the table. We'd like to get your ID. Do you mind? Yes, sounds again, sobbing. Is there anyone else here? No. Is the house safe? Yes. The door closes and the ringing stops. Hearing this, Gary was filled with joy. He just started laughing. He made a tape. He sent it to dad, but not to mom. Gary spent the rest of Sunday at home doing chores and repairs that he hadn't gotten around to lately. He mowed the grass. That always calmed him down. However, scenes from the phone continued to disturb his peace of mind. It wasn't so much about Mara. He was done with her and hoped never to see her again. It was about O'Sullivan, the asshole. He knew Marie was married. He even knew Gary a little. 
It was a calculated act of disrespect on his part, and it had to be dealt with or Gary would never find peace. He'd made some inquiries about O'Sullivan on the internet. Just the basics. His buddy did the rest. Gary didn't want the computer search to turn up anything on his car, but he figured anyone would understand how he did basic research. In fact, if he didn't do something like that, it would look weird. So he did. O'Sullivan was married and had two young children, ages three and four. He had been at his current job for a year and a half. Prior to that, he had worked in New York City. That information, along with his address and phone number, was all he was able to find out. Gary called his buddy. He had more information and quite a few details about a previous incident at his job in New York. It involved some form of theft. Gary asked his buddy to do a thorough search to see if his current employer knew about it. He then went to a local restaurant for dinner. He was served fried catfish, fries, and salad. He had an iron stomach, and despite the tension he was feeling, the food didn't bother him. On the way home, he bought a cell phone. Then he found a vacant electronics store and bought three things. Two GPS trackers and a voice recorder, which he set up to download into his old laptop. One GPS tracker he put under a tire in the trunk of Mare's SUV, but he never used the rest of the stuff. Before going to bed, he watched an old western with Gary Cooper. On Monday, Mayor's bail hearing was scheduled for 10 a.m. Gary parked in a parking lot nearby. He walked the three blocks to the courthouse. He was dressed in slacks, an unremarkable button-down shirt, and a baseball cap. He was cautious. He didn't want Tim or Jim to catch him off guard. At 9.55, he turned the corner and entered the courtroom. Tim, Jim, and a few of Ann and Jane's relatives were there. Mayor's people weren't there. Her parents lived far away. But Gary's mother was there, in the front row. There was also a contingent of press in the front. No one saw Gary. He was sitting in the far corner of the room, and it was dark. Everyone stood up, and there was the clang of a gavel. A burglary case was heard, and the accused was released on bail. Then a sexual assault case was announced, all three accused. All three were let out of a cell at the back of the hall. Each of them was dressed in street clothes, crumpled street clothes. Mayor looked haggard and frightened. She had a lawyer and not a government lawyer. All three of them had lawyers. Gary wondered how that had worked out. Anne and Jane were released on $50,000 bail. Mayor, as the leader of the conspiracy, $75,000. Yeah, the government filed a new charge, conspiracy to assault. All three were released. The government got a restraining order against all three women. None of them could go near Gary, call, or text him. Mary's lawyer protested since she lived with me, but it was no use. The judge said she could make her own arrangements to take whatever she needed from the house. While the relatives were talking to the lawyers, Gary was already out the door, but Tim watched him go. There he is! There he is! The rat bastard! Sheriff's deputies rushed after him. Jim followed Gary out into the hallway. Wait, Gary, please wait. Detective Mason was outside the courtroom as well. Jim ran up to Gary. You have to drop these charges, Gary. Please. It's going to kill Jane. She'll lose her job. What about the kids? Please. I can't just drop the charges. The state brought them forward, and I have no control over anything else. You can tell them not to proceed. You're the victim. They'll listen. You can just not show up to court. Detective Mason spoke up. You've just committed obstruction of justice, sir. I would advise you to leave now. Feelings are running high, so I'll leave it at that, but no more. Of course, officer, I'm sorry. He returned to the courtroom. On Monday, all three were out on bail. Mayor's parents posted theirs. Then they called me and came to get her things. I was polite to them. They knew what had happened. They were upset, but it didn't seem to be because of me. Her mother left in her car. And it turned out that Mayor was staying with an acquaintance of theirs since she couldn't leave the jurisdiction. I made an appointment with a lawyer for the next day. I also went to the bank and HR to take even more care to rule out any financial connection to Mayor. I took it all pretty calmly. Perhaps I was shocked by Mayor's stupid reaction. And until that day, I had loved her. But it seemed to me that the person I loved was not at all who Mayor actually turned out to be. I was still thinking about O'Sullivan, though. That evening, my buddy called. He had some new information. O'Sullivan hadn't given his current employer much detail about his previous difficulties. 
I didn't want to know where he got that information. He sent me a description of what had happened. O'Sullivan worked at a brokerage firm and withdrew small amounts of money from large accounts. The firm let him go when they found out, but wrote him a standard letter of recommendation. That's how he got the job here. My friend also found out more about his family life. As far as we could tell, he was not a womanizer. He was a soccer coach for a team of four-year-olds. He had a beautiful wife who worked at a law firm as an assistant. I thought about how I could get my revenge. I could just tell his wife about having sex with Mara and tell her at work about his previous thefts. That would hurt him a lot. But that didn't seem quite right, as it would hurt the family too, especially the kids. I put the matter aside for later. I was sure that someday, after some time, I would be able to ruin his mood in a big way. I met with a lawyer about the divorce. Her name was Ellen Yao. She was sharp. She explained that I would have a say in any such case based on what happened. She decided that we would split 50% of all assets, except the house. She was going to try to make sure I got it all. The equity was about $55,000. I had her prepare the paperwork. I then went to the prosecutor's office for an interview. It turned out that I was to testify before a grand jury. The prosecutor, Ryan Adams, told me about the events of the previous week. Then I testified. It wasn't difficult. Some of the jurors smiled at some of the facts, but some seemed very angry. After the prosecutor opened the subject, there were a few questions from them. Mostly they wanted to know if I was doing well. I told them I was doing fine. I was touched by their concern. When we left the room, the prosecutor was elated. Those questions at the end were a real indication of how the trial would go, if there was a trial. We went back to his office and discussed what I thought about the outcome of the case. Did I want the women to go to prison? Did I want my wife to get jail time? I didn't give it much thought. I told him I thought they should all get felony convictions, but I said I would like each of them to do time in jail or prison, although not too much. He asked what I meant. Maybe six or eight months for Jane and Anne, a year for Mare. What about the boys? I suppose they could be charged, too at least on drug charges. I'm going to press the women until they get the hang of it. I think they should have some kind of record, no time limit. That's how it worked out, for the most part. Anne and Jane each got four months and two years probation. Mayor got eight months and two years. Jim and Tim got threatening charges for the phone calls, no jail time. All of this happened just a month later. Mari turned herself in the day she pleaded guilty. She served seven months with good time. Meanwhile, the divorce went easily. She didn't contest it. As for O'Sullivan, I called him with a burner. I simply said I'd meet him at Rocky's Bar on Thursday at 8 o'clock. If he wasn't there, I would send emails to his wife with pictures of sex and to his work with details of the theft in New York. I had a friend in case he brought a gun or knife. I was sitting at the bar when he walked in. Hey, asshole. Look. I'm really sorry about what happened. Your wife said you cheated, and she's so hot, so I couldn't resist. You knew I was married to her. You were married to her. You had to leave. What would happen if I told you everything? You know I have proof. You sent the pictures. I'm finished. I'm going to lose everything. Just like me, huh? You survived. Please don't destroy my family. Tell you what, you and I are going out back. We're going to fight. What happens, happens. We're about the same height, and I realize you've been boxing. The bar will call the police. No, I've made a deal. Angelo will make sure there are no cops. One of us will get mugged. He smiled. And then it's over even if I beat your ass. Yes, but if I hurt you and you tell the cops my name or description, I'll send emails. By the way, if you kill me, the emails will still be sent. Then let's get on with it. We went out the back door. My buddy followed us and searched O'Sullivan for weapons. He had a gun, and that worried me a little. If he had a gun or a knife, okay. But a sap was for sneaking. It required dexterity, too. We paired up, and I fainted to hit him a few times. Then he tried a left hook. It was a good punch, but I fell short. I hit him hard on the kidney. I hit him again right there because he didn't have time to step back. I backed off for a few seconds and he stood straight up, panting. 
but he already knew what was in store for him. I moved forward. He tried to duck, but I caught him with a right kick to the ribs. I pressed him into the wall and began to work on his body. Work very hard. When I thought he couldn't handle it anymore, I backed off. I give him credit for that. He tried to hit me again, but he just fell flat on his face when he missed. That's it, that's enough, said I. I bent over him and took his wallet. The robbery, remember? I remember. He rolled onto his side and curled up. I'll have Angelo call an ambulance. My friend and I left. He gave O'Sullivan's money to a homeless woman outside the shelter. I thought it was a bad idea, but the deed was done and there was no undoing it. He threw his wallet in the trash. O'Sullivan kept his word and so did I. When Mare got out of prison, she no longer had orders to stay away from me. We divorced and I owned the house along with the bank. One evening I was sitting on the back patio when the doorbell rang. It was Mare. Can I come in? I just want to talk. You can come in for a minute. I don't think we have anything to say to each other. I wanted to apologize for everything I did. It ruined our marriage and my life. It was so stupid. And why didn't you just ask me about what your friend said? It could have been easily avoided. I went through several individual counseling sessions in prison. I think it was all because of my insecurities. My parents had a big problem with infidelity. Well, I'm not them. She cried silently, looking around the house she used to live in. Nothing will ever be the same, she said in a shaky voice. Maybe the lesson has been learned. I heard Mike O'Sullivan was mugged and spent 10 days in the hospital, she said. Yeah, I heard that too. On the other hand, he's got a family left, and you and I are going to have to start over. She nodded. I love you, Gary. I'm so sorry I messed things up. She turned and walked out. It was eight years before I saw her again. My mom had invited her to our second son's first birthday party. Dr. Betty G's son and me. Mayor brought her new friend Johnny. She thought he was a nice guy. She was emotional at the party, but not too much. We didn't talk much. She and my mom hung out afterward. She married Johnny and they had twin girls. I just hoped there weren't any misunderstandings.